Amen. So Matthew chapter 25, moving along here, coming into the towards the end of the book. So we got a few more weeks left here. But we are in Matthew 25 tonight, beginning in verse 1, where the Bible reads, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, right out of the gate, it's important to remember that Matthew 25, obviously, is following Matthew chapter 24. And if you notice there, in verse 1, it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the like in them ten versions. So the then there is what I want to point out. That so we see here that it's you know chronological order. It's taking place after the events of Matthew 24. And what were the events of Matthew 24? Well, that was when Christ's return, and that's describing uh, the events leading up to his wrath and pertaining primarily to believers. And the events of Matthew 25 have a lot to do with what's going to take place uh, on earth while believers are, st are still here. It leads up to the point where Christ returns. So we see these are kind of, Matthew 25 really is showing us what's going to take place afterwards when Christ returns and sets up his millennial kingdom. And a lot of the, like the events of Matthew 24, they, a lot of them pertain not necessarily unto, more unto believers and non-believers. We're going to see tonight that really these parables and the story that we read here, they're dealing with both. It's dealing with believers and unbelievers. And there's some confusion sometimes when we read these parables about the servants and the five foolish versions, where they saved, are they unsaved, who are these people, how do they fit in the story. And I think once we kind of go through and look at some other passages, when we interpret uh, Scripture with, with Scripture, uh, we're going to see that it's applying, uh, these parables are speaking to both believers and unbelievers, that both have a part in these things. So Matthew, again, Matthew 20, 24 is describing events leading up to God's wrath and pertains primarily to believers. And then chapter 25 begins to deal with unbelievers. And it really begins and ends with that theme where it's talking about what are going to happen to unbelievers uh, when Christ returns. And it says here in verse 2, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. But they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, <laughs> while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us oil of your, uh, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they, were all, and they that were all ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward uh, came also other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know, uh, know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now really before we kind of get into the meat of this, uh, this parable here, I want to point out again, and I pointed this out in, in other sermons, the fact that it says, You know not the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And again, as, as those that would uh, you know, subscribe to a um, you know, post-trib, pre-trib uh, rapture. <clears throat> That's one of the criticisms that kind of get levied at, uh, leveled at us often is that you guys, well, you guys are saying you can predict the day and the hour. No, we've never said that. Not even. Jesus said you cannot know the day or the hour. We've never claimed to know that. He does say that you can know the times and the seasons, <clears throat> which is explained in First Thessalonians 1. You have to turn there. Where Paul said, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to unto you, uh, for you per yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. You know, and, and Jesus implores us in several places to watch and to, to discern uh, the signs of the times. And, to, and he describes what those days will be like for a reason. And he says they'll be as the days of Noah. They shall be as the days of, you know, uh, of Lot. And, and he's describing the type of things that are going to take place. So we can definitely discern the times. We can definitely discern the seasons of Christ's return. I mean, I mean, we'd have to say today as we look around to say that Christ's return could come in our lifetimes, is not far-fetched. Right. I mean, everything's in place for a one-world government that has to take place. Yeah. The, world, the, the, the love of cold is, is the, the love of many is waxing cold. You know, and iniquity is abounding. We're seeing things taking place um, that we've never seen before. And when it comes specifically to sin, specifically to the sin of you know um, sodomy, that 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 terrible wicked sin that's just being spread worldwide. You know, Pastor Anderson preached uh, pointed that out in a sermon on Sunday night. I thought. A lot of people have, have, have come to me and, and, and said, man, that was a profound point that we've never really considered. The fact that, you know, it used to be that, you know, it was Sodom and Gomorrah that got destroyed because they were the only ones that were guilty of it. Mm -hmm. It was the triumph of the Benjamites, the, the Benjamites because they were the ones that harbored that filth inside of their community. And now we're at a point where it's not just one country, it's not just one group of people. This sin is, is spreading worldwide. We have a, we have a president now. 
who's made it his purpose to go out and legalize homosexuality throughout the world. So what, I mean, what God did to one nation, he's going to do to a whole world. And the point I'm trying to make is that we can look and we can see the signs of the times and yeah. we can say, truly, he is at the door. And, and, and our salvation is, 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 is nearer than when we first believed. So again, just touching on that, you know, no, we don't know the day or the hour. No one's ever claimed that. You know, those that have have been, you know, false prophets and cults. I mean, there have people that have said, you know, Jehovah Witnesses have said on several occasions, yep. not only when Jesus is coming, but then have gone been so bold to say, well, he in fact he he came, it did happen. Mm -hmm. But it was just to us. You know, he only appeared to us, and here's what he said. And they and they try to pass that off. And they've done that several times, even in recent history. You know, I preached a sermon on him a few a while back. I mean that. As, as just as recently as the, as the mid 70s they said something like that was the last time I don't think they've done it recently but there's been other people and we could talk about that but we've never done that you know our church our pastor and he's never said this is the day and hour in right. fact he's even gone so far as to say that if you ever hear anybody saying it's going to be on this day you can mark that day off your calendar yeah, why right. because no man knoweth the day nor the hour Amen. that's not to say you can't know the times and seasons of Christ's return right. so but really what we want to focus on Specifically this evening a little bit more is the understanding the parable of the ten virgins And I think a lot of people they, they get a little confused because they think well, you know, they're both they both know who the Lord is You know, they're both trying to get in they're both trying to be ready when the Lord comes and really what it's uh, showing us here is that this parable is spoken uh, Two types to two types of people in, in this parable. You have the, the, the of course you have the five wise and the five foolish and Really it breaks into this that there's two types of people there are those who are saved, and there are those who think they are saved, yep. but are not saved. Yep. And that's who these two types of people are in this parable. So we see that here when we start to look at other scriptures. If you would, turn over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're going to turn to several passages tonight to kind of see how this theme is something that's carried throughout the New Testament. Jesus has spoken of this often, using a lot of even the same wording and phrasing to describe uh, these types of people. You'll notice there in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. You know, like have your candle ready, have your lamp ready. He said, let your light so shine before men. So this is uh, wording that he uses often. And he yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Right? And that's what the virgins were doing. They were waiting for the Lord to come. They were ready. They had their lights burning. When he returned from the wedding, right? It was a bridegroom that we read about over there in Matthew 25. Then when he come and uh, then when he come and, and knock it that he may open right wasn't that what, what they were doing there knocking on the door Lord let us in so we see there's a lot of this similarity here and he says in verse 37 blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants and this note that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore, uh, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? So really that's kind of the same question we have when we read some of these parables. We might read that parable of the ten virgins and think, Lord, speaketh thou this unto us, or even unto all? Is this just for believers, or is this something that applies to non-believers as well? And we're going to see tonight that it, it applies to non-believers. It, it applies to those that believe and also those that think they're saved and are not. If you would, turn over to Luke chapter 13. Just one page, a few pages over in your Bible, likely. Luke chapter 13 and verse 23, the Bible says, Then said one of them, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. So again, he's, he's, he's telling you about people that are trying to enter in. Just like those, uh, those foolish versions were trying to get in the door. They wanted to get into the... Uh, the, 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 the chamber. <clears throat> They're trying, now he's describing people that are trying to enter in at the gate, right? He said this, For many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Did we not see that in the same parable? Mm -hmm. People trying to enter in and not being able to enter in. When once the master of the house has risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. I mean, that's practically the same, almost the exact same situation we read about in the parable in Matthew 25. We have people coming to the door, knocking, saying, let us in, and him saying, I know you not. I know not whence you are. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> yeah. 
We got new neighbors on the other side of the wall, by the way. I don't know if they're still in there, but they might hear something tonight. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, that says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart uh, from me, ye that work iniquity. So again, the parable is showing us two types of people. Those who are saved and those who think that they're, that they're saved, but they're not. And that's what we see there in Matthew chapter 7 as well. Some, some of that same language. The same predicament, the same situation of people trying to enter in and even calling Him Lord and not being able to enter in. And we see that in several of those other passages that we read. Now, in that parable of the virgins there, it says that all ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom, didn't they? All ten of them knew who he was. They went out to meet him, and the, sh and, the and the door was shut to five of them who had no oil. Right? That's kind. Of, that's going to come into play a little bit later. But they had no oil. That's really what the difference was between the two of them. They both knew who the Lord was. They both knew what door to go to. They knew what door to go and knock at. Right? They knew Jesus, Jesus said, "I am the door." They know that that's where you got to go. Jesus. They'll even say, "Well, Jesus, you know, he is God." Yeah, we'll go knock at that door. He's the door. They knew which door was the right door. They will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Right. And that's not because they couldn't find the door. It's because of something else. Because they're trying to get in the wrong way. All ten virgins knew who the bridegroom was, didn't they? They all knew who the bridegroom was. They're all waiting on the same guy. Just like here where it says, you know, they all call him Lord, Lord. We saw that back there in Luke chapter 13. They said, Lord, Lord, have we not done... Many wonderful you know, works in thy name. You know, open unto us. They, they're calling at the right name. They know who he is. They're going to the right door, but there's a difference. So the difference between the, the, the ten virgins is not knowing who to go to or where to go to, but that five had oil and five did not. Is that, that's, the, that's what the, the, the parable shows us, that five had oil and five didn't. And that oil was really important. It was so important that the other five that did had not were trying to buy it off the other ones, and they were like, no, we're not giving it up. So that's the difference there. Now, what is the oil? Well, the oil is the Holy Spirit. If we were to go through and, and do a, a study of that throughout Scripture, you'll see that oil, the oil often is associated with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. We won't take time to turn all those passages, but it says, we could re probably remind you, we all know of, the fa of David, who was anointed of Saul, right? David was anointed of Saul. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, the Bible says, from that day forward. So, of course, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord came upon people. You know, it wasn't just the indwelling like we have today. We have the indwelling, the sealing of the Holy Ghost. We'll never leave that. We'll never lose that. But we also can have the Lord resting upon us or Him not resting upon us. But when did the Lord come upon him? When did the Spirit of the Lord come upon him? He was anointed with that oil. The same thing could be said of Saul. When Saul was anointed with oil, uh, um, Samuel said to him, he said, you know, when you go from here, after you anoint him, he says, you're going to go from here and you shall become another man. The Spirit of the Lord shall come upon you and shall prophesy. And that happened. So the anointing of uh, the oil or the, the, the uh, is associated with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon a person. So that's what the difference is here with these, these virgins. They had the oil and some didn't. Some of us have the Holy Ghost and then the, and then the other ones don't. Right. And how do you receive the Holy Ghost? Through salvation. Right. You know, you're sealed by the Holy Ghost on the day of your redemption. You're given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you receive that oil, so to speak. So we see that oil is associated with the Holy Spirit. Oil also in Scripture is associated with uh, being appointed by the Lord or unto, uh, un either unto Him or being appointed. So, you know, often things that were used in the service of the tabernacle were, uh, were, were, were uh, anointed with oil. Or those servants, the high priests and others that would do work for him. They were, they're were being recognized by God and saying he's acknowledging them. As in they are in his service. He's saying these are my servants. These are those that are doing my work. They were often anointed with oil. Uh, you know, Jehu would be one. We could turn to him when he was anointed to go and, and uh, um, you know overthrow Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, they came to him and they anointed him with oil. And again, Solomon was another one. When he became king, one of the first things they did is they anointed him with oil. Yeah. So the, we see the difference between the five uh, foolish and the five wise virgins is not about who they're going to. They didn't know. It's not that they didn't know the way to get there. They were going to the right place. They were even saying the right name, but they were not saved. They thought they were, 
They thought they were the Lord's. They were shocked when they got there and found out He's not opening to us. But He didn't because they didn't have that oil. So to have the oil, you know, figuratively speaking, is to have the Holy Ghost. It's to be saved. It's to have salvation. It's to have the sealing of God. Amen. It's to be known of God, right? So those that enter in, uh, the Bible tells us there, if, and I don't know if I had you stay there, but um, if, you're, if you're in Matthew chapter 7, if you're there still, Matthew 7, it says there, verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone. Then he goes on and says this, But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So who's going to enter in? Him that doeth the will of the Father. Those are the ones that are going to be able to enter in. Those that are doing His will. So what is it to do the will of the Father? Well, that is to believe in Christ and receive eternal life. That is the will of the Father. Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 6. Because a lot of people get confused on that. They think that the will of the Father is living a good life or doing good works or going to church or being baptized or any number of things that people will do out of just religious habit you know, or something that just a church teaches them. And you'll think, well, that's the will of God. And it's true there are many things in the Bible that we ought to do that are the will of God, but in able to be able to enter in into, into heaven and be able to be saved and go into the kingdom of heaven, there is something that we all have to do. In fact, there's one thing you have to do. The Bible says in John 6, look at verse 39, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me. So he's about to tell us what it is. That all which he hath given unto me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. So there's your eternal security that when you are saved, when you are when he gives when uh, when he gives you to Jesus, when you are saved, when you when Christ receives you or you receive him, however you want to look at it, you shall he shall not lose you. Amen. You know, you're never going to be lost until the day uh, until he raises you up again at the last day. Amen. And this is the will of him that sent me. This is the will of the Father. It says there in verse forty, that everyone which seeth the Son and believe on him believeth on him, may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So what is the will of the Father? That we would see him, and that we would believe on him, and that we would have everlasting life. That's, that's what it is to do the will of the Father, is to believe on him. So that, And that's exactly the opposite of, of these people that we read about, that we just read about. These people, they're not coming to Christ simply by faith. They're not, they don't have the oil because they haven't come to Christ in faith. They're coming to him thinking that they have to do, as they said, many wonderful works, right? They cast out devils. You know, we've done many wonderful works in thy name. They're not relying on their own works. They're not saying, let us in, we believed on you, we've done the will of the Father, we've seen you, we believe you, you gave us everlasting life, and you said you'd never lose us. Right. You know, when I get to heaven and, and, I, and I stand before God, He says, why should I lay in? Because I believed. Right. That's going to be my only answer. Because right. of the blood, I put my faith in the shed blood of your Son, the death, burial, and resurre resurrection of Christ. Right. Not because, you know, I've done all these wonderful works. Yeah. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith of that, not of yourselves. It says it is the gift of God, not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. Yeah. It's exactly what these people are doing here. We have done many wonderful works yeah. in thy name. Yeah, it was in your name, but we're the ones that did them. Right. And they were wonderful. You know, what we did was wonderful works. We didn't do the mediocre works. You know, we did the wonderful ones. That's it's boasting, it's bragging. It's not giving glory to God. The Bible says no flesh should glory in His presence. Amen. So people are thinking that they're saved because they've done many wonderful works. They don't receive Christ. They don't have the oil. They know who Jesus is. They know who the bridegroom is. They're knocking at the door. But He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you know, we read there, He says, I'll never knew you. It doesn't say, I used to know you. Yeah. He said, I never knew you. So this idea of, well, He used to know me, now He doesn't, that's not biblical. You know, I did know you, but then, you know, you slipped up, and now you're unsaved. That's not how it works. He said, I never knew you. You know, just like it says in John, uh, uh, John 3, because, you know, he is condemned because he hath not believed. Right? Right. That's why a person is condemned. Not because he used to believe, because he hath not believed. So, salvation is a one-time event. I'm kind of going off a rabbit trail there. But we see here clearly that salvation is not of works. And really, that's what the parable of the ten virgins is showing us. That there are those who are going to go... Without the oil, without the, 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 the sealing of the Holy Spirit, they're not going to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They're not going to be gods. They're going to go there. They're going to try to get there on their own works. What are they doing? They're trying to buy the oil from somebody yeah. else. They're trying to you know, buy their way in. They're trying to purchase salvation through their own works, through their own efforts. And that's really the meaning of that, of that parable. And the rest of the parables, you know, the next one we're going to look at, it's the same thing. And that's what really the theme of this, um, this entire chapter is. 
that there are people who think they are saved, and there are people and they're not, and there's people who are saved. That's really who we're dealing with here. So if you would look there back in Matthew chapter 25, we're going to pick it back up with the, uh, verse 14. Where he moves on to this next parable, which reads, For uh, the kingdom of heaven is, is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one of them he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them father five talents. And likewise also he that had received two also gained other two. But he that received one, one went and digged in the earth, and hid his, Lord, uh, hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained them uh, five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou to the joy of the Lord. Now, really, before we kind of break this down, that's an important principle that we should take note of in Scripture. What does he say there? He says, Thou hast been faithful in a few, over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. So we got to get this idea in our head. We should not uh, allow this uh, idea in our head, I rather, I should say, that the little things don't matter. The little things are what matter. Being faithful in the little things are really what matter because that's going to tell you whether or not you can be faithful over big things. Whether God can give, you know, can commit more unto your trust. You know, if we can't be faithful in the little things, why in the world would anyone ever think that we should be given more? It doesn't make any sense. But people get this idea that the little things don't matter. But Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faith, or he that is, 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 excuse me, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. So some people think, have this idea, well, I'll be, I'll be better at my job when I'm given more responsibility. That's not how it works. If you can't be trusted in little things, you're not going to be trusted with the big things. So if you want to have more, you have to be faithful in what you do have. You know, and I don't want to get up and, and try to lift my, I'm not trying to lift myself up or anything like that, but, you know, I couldn't help but kind of think a little bit about myself here because of the fact that, you know, I am the deacon. And some people wonder, how in the world did that ever happen, right? And then sometimes I ask myself, that, how did this happen? Why me, you know? I'm still pinching myself, like, what? Me? But, uh, and really when it came to me, when it was offered to me, it, it was out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. You know, I was thinking I might, if, you know, Lord willing, and Pastor Anderson thought, thought that I would be doing a good job at it, maybe I could send out and go pastor church somewhere. I mean, I didn't even think being the deacon and faithful word was even on the table. I never even considered it. You know, about a week prior to me, uh, Brother Segura coming to me and, and telling me that they wanted to offer me that position, you know, I prayed a week prior to that, saying, Lord, I don't know what it is you want for my life, but whatever it is, I'm willing to do it. And then about a week later, you know, this, this offer came, and I'm thinking, well, there you go. That's an answer to prayer. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure what all went into the decision-making, but I know one thing that Brother Chris Segura said to me that will never stick out. That will stick out. when Because he, he kind of, you know, made the case for me. There were several other guys. He said, well, Brother Corbin, he's actually doing things right now. You know, one of the things I was doing it was cleaning the building. You know, I was showing up every other weekend and scrubbing toilets and vacuuming and wiping mother baby rooms down and cleaning mirrors and doing little things. And you know what? Somebody noticed that. And I've been doing that for a few years. And they said, wow, he's been doing these little things without even really having been asked. He volunteered to do that. He's not being paid to do that. He's being faithful now, which is little. Let's give him more. Let's give him a bigger responsibility. Right. So, you know, and again, I'm not trying to say that to like, look at me, look what I did. But that's just, you know, that's just an example that I can think of. You know, we could probably think of other people that, you know, are doing the same thing. People that are being faithful in that, which is little. You know, it might not come overnight, but you mark it down if, you, if you're being faithful in that which is least. You know, it's only a matter of time before somebody says, well, when the, when the need comes, when there's a greater responsibility, you can say, well, let's find the guy that's been faithful in that which is least. Yeah. You know, and a lot of guys, you know, they, they want to preach, they want to be pastors one day. You know, they really need to, to, to take note of that, you know, because that's really what it's going to come down to. When someone's going to consider somebody for a position like that, well, what has he been doing? You know, not... Not what is he capable of doing or what is his potential, but actually what has he been doing? And that's really what it comes down to. Guys who want more need to make sure that they're doing uh, doing things now, being faithful in that, which is least. So that's just a principle. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but it is something that needs to be pointed out because it's a good reminder. It's a good thing to kind of keep in mind as we 
serve alongside him in the ministry. Now it says there in verse 22, He also that received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Why couldn't you do better? The guy who had five got five. No, that's not what he said. He said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. So again, another principle there is like, you, you know, one had five, one had two, but they both got the same reward. You know, he because they did what they could with what they were given. Yeah. You know, if people are doing the best they can with what they have been given, God's going to reward them for that. You know, it's not necessarily the quantity of what you end up with, it's it's what you start out with. What do you do with what you start out with? If you multiply it, if you get more than what you started with, if you're making good use of that which God has given you, then the reward is the same. You know, some people have more ability than others. You know, um, I know we've had several people just recently that are playing musical instruments. You know, we had uh, the playing guitar tonight, another uh, young lady in the church has gotten up and played piano. You know, we got Brother Solomon that comes down here. I've played instruments in the past in the church. You know, and a long time ago what I heard a pastor say, he said, you know, I don't care if somebody gets up and plays an instrument and messes up the whole song. All right. If somebody gets up and plays an instrument and they just they mess up, they're nervous, they make a wreck out of it, if they've been practicing, if they've been putting forth their due diligence, if they've been putting forth the effort to play, then they're, they've done what they needed to do. You know, if they're messing up because they've never practiced or anything like that, well then, you know, shame on them. But here's the thing, if you're putting forth the effort, if you're putting forth doing what you can with what you've been given, then it's a blessing, Amen. You know, no matter how it turns out. It's the same principle here. We say well, one guy's given five, and he's able to do so much more. Another guy's given two, but he's, he does more as well. And the reward is the same for both of them. Why? Because they made use of what they had. They didn't just sit on it and do nothing with it. So here it says in uh, <clears throat> verse 24, <clears throat> I think that's where we left off. Yeah. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Now, would we get the impression from the last two servants that this guy's a hard man? Not at all. I mean, he's giving them talents, saying, doing something with it. Either coming back and having done something with it and saying, great, here's more. Yeah. You know, here, let me bless you even more. That's not, that's not an accurate description of this man to say he is a hard man. This guy doesn't know the Lord. So again, here we have people that are saved and people that think that they're saved, but they really don't know who God is. And that's who this guy is. He said, I know thee that thou art a hard man. That's not true. Reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not straw. I mean, he makes him sound like he's some kind of thief. Like yeah. he's some kind of robber just taking things that aren't his. They were his talents, yeah. you know, that he gave him in the first place. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there hast thou that is thine. His Lord and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest I reap where I sowed not, and gather what I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that shall be uh, hath shall be given, and he that hath abundant, uh, and, 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 shall, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And ye, and cast ye the unprofitable ser servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Now people get confused. They say, "Wait a minute." They'll say, "How can you be cast out of darkness?" Because that's a description of hell. Right. I mean, every time you read about those type of those those uh, that phrase, those phrases, outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's talking about people going to hell in other passages. They'll say, "Well, how can you send one of his own servants there?" But here's the thing: simply be calling a servant or appearing as a servant doesn't mean you're saved. I mean, we read about that earlier. We have done many wonderful works. We served you. We're your servants. You know, when God has used, uh, has used wicked people, when we go through the Old Testament, God used wicked kings and wicked nations as his servant. He calls them his servant, but they're heathen, to punish his own people. Yeah. So just because they're called a servant, being used of God, or just because they appear as a, ser a servant, doesn't mean that they're saved. Right. That means they're just playing a role. You know, all, all, the, all the ten, were all white, they were all virgins, right? They all had that. But only... But only five were wise and five were foolish. So, you know, just because you're called a servant doesn't mean you're necessarily saved. I mean, Jesus said, I call you no more servants, but I call you friends. You know, henceforth, I call you servants, but now I call you friends. He said to his disciples when he washed their feet. So what really matters is that you're known of God, not necessarily that you've just done service for God, that you've done works for God. I mean, do we have to do works for God? we have to be his servant in order to go to heaven? No. We have to do the one thing, which is to believe, to know God. That's what it is, to be his friend. <clears throat> so verse 31, 
excuse me, well, these, you know, these parables just kind of show us again what the main theme there. That there are some people who think they're saved and they're not. They, 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 they have the phraseology right, they even do works, they even call themselves servants, but they don't know who God is and they're going to be shocked one day when they get there. And there's going to be a lot of people like that, unfortunately. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of people that have been living good, clean, moral lives to the best of their ability, and been going to churches and taking sacraments and being baptized and trying to you know, keep the commandments and just live good, moral lives. And they're, you know what? The world will look at them and say they're good people. They're fine, upstanding people. They're not drunks. They don't, you know, they're good to their family, all of these things. But they're going to get to heaven and say, well... I know how I'm getting in. Yeah. All my good works are going to get me in. I lived right. a good life. Right. And can you imagine having done all that work and gone through all that effort just to find out that's not what it took? Yeah. That you didn't do the one thing. And the only thing you were really counting on was your own pride to get you to heaven. That's going to be a sad day for a lot of people. But it says there in verse 31, you know, it kind of moves on and begins to describe the events of the millennium. That's really what we're seeing here in verse 31. Where he says, uh, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory... And all the holy angels with him, and he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. So again, this is the, uh, the millennial, millennial reign when he's sitting up his throne. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a, she a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. So again, this theme just continues throughout this whole chapter of people who are saved and people who aren't saved. Sheep and goats, wise virgins and foolish virgins, faithful servants and slothful servants. Now, if you would, actually, I'll just read to you for sake of time from Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, where it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice, uh, great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our, our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. So this is, of course, at the end of the last trump there, uh, when he's the, last, the seventh angel, the, ad, the last angel sounds, and there's a great voice. This is the last trump, the end of God's wrath, Him setting up His millennial reign. And it says in verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, in the time of the dead, and that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants and the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So it kind of lines up here with what he's describing in, in Matthew 25, when he's going to divide the sheep uh, from the goats. You know, he's going to come, he's going to set up his throne after, you know, after, after God's wrath is poured out. And he's going to, and the nations are going to be angry. And then he's going to reward some people, isn't he? He's going to reward his prophets. He's going to reward, uh, he's going to reward his prophets. He's going to reward the saints and to them that fear thy name. And then what else is he going to do? That's the sheep, right? And then the goats. He's going to cast into outer darkness, like he did the, un the unprofitable servant. He's going to shut out the five foolish virgins. He's going to destroy them, which destroy the earth. He's going to destroy the goats. He's going to appoint them their portion of the hypocrites. So, you know, the same events again, uh, I don't really have time to go into it, are described in Revelation chapter 19, where the nations are divided. You know, you see those that are rewarded with fine linen, you know, which is the righteousness of the saints. You know, they're the bride of Christ. And what is the bride of Christ? What is the righteousness of the saints? It's Christ's righteousness. It's His blood that's been, uh, His righteousness that has been imputed unto us, you know, through the precious blood of Christ as in the blood of the Lamb. So, just jump down to verse 34. Uh, we're kind of running out of time here, but it says there in verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his, uh, on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the king and prepare for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. Then shall the righteous, righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when, shall, uh, or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? The king, uh, and the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, in so, in so much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So, you know, that should really tell us we ought to be careful how we treat one another. You know, you know there might be somebody that you don't think it's, it's, it's all that in a bag of chips. You know, they don't have everything together. But you know, if they're saved, if they're God's child, you know, we should be careful how we treat God's people. We should, we should uh, make sure that we treat them kindly. And that, you know, if they have a need, we should meet that need. Because I don't care who that person is. If they're saved, if that's somebody that Christ has died for and, 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 and shed His blood and suffered for, 
you know, he, that person is precious unto Christ, even if we don't consider that person very important. Right. I mean, say, you know, well, they don't do a whole lot around here. You know, they're not as important as me. You know, but here's the thing. They're important to God. You know, and, and, and no matter what, if they're doing what they can, you know, if they have a need, we should meet that. We should try to do what we can to help God's people. Because when you do it unto them, even the least of his brethren, you're doing it as unto him. You know, that's that's really what this he's kind of showing us here. <clears throat> and it says there in verse 41, then say, and then shall he say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, how long is that fire? It's everlasting. Right, so take that, JWs. You know, it's not it's not annihilation. It's everlasting fire. For I was hungered and he gave me no meat. I was thirsty and he gave me no drink. I was a stranger and he took me not in. Naked and he clothed me not. Sick and in prison and he visited me not. Then shall they answer unto him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger or thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then he answered them, saying, Verily I say unto you, as much as you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not uh, unto to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. So again, it's everlasting punishment. You know, there's, uh, there's this crazy doctrine out there that, you know, or when you die, if you don't go to heaven, or you're not resurrected, you just cease to exist. You know, and let me tell you, that's a very pleasant uh, uh, alter alternative to the reality. Right. I would rather not exist at all than to have to experience everlasting punishment. Mm -hmm. But that is uh, the actual punishment that's going to take place, that it's everlasting fire and punishment. So this entire chapter really, though, just to kind of sum up, is about the saved and the unsaved being separated from one another at the time of Christ's return. I mean, that's the chronology there. When he begins in the very beginning, he says, then. right? So it's the things that come after Matthew 24. He explains to us that there's going to be a separation from the saved and the unsaved. And that you know the, the nations are going to be divided at, at when he returns and sets up his kingdom. You know, we saw that with the wise virgins being separated from the foolish, the faithful servants being separated from the slothful, the sheep are separated from the goats, theirs that cared for the least of his brethren are separated from those that didn't. And the, really the main point that we can walk away from this is that everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, will not enter in. That just because there's a lot of people who are using the name of Jesus Christ right. and claiming the name of Christ, that does not mean they're saved. That does not mean, you know, they're doing works they're out there knocking doors like us and trying to spread their own religion. They're trying to talk to people. They're doing all these other things and trying to evangelize the world with their false gospel. That does not mean that they're saved. <clears throat> Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Enter in at the, at the straight gate, for wide is the gate which brought, and brought us away that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth them to eternal life, and few there be that find it. So why is it that there are so many headed to destruction? And that's what Jesus said, that more people are going to hell. And more people are going to end up in the everlasting punishment than in eternal life. It's because of the same problems that we just read about. They're seeking it by works, yep. by purchasing the oil, by not doing His will of believing, simply just having faith. They're trying to do the work, many wonderful works. And really, what we can take from this, how do we apply this to our lives? What do we do with this sermon? Well, we understand the, the severity of the punishment that awaits people who are trusting in themselves, and that should burden us. Not to just, you know, go, ha, ha, na, 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 boo, I got it, you don't. But actually go out there and try to win them to the Lord. Amen. That we should understand what it takes to be saved, and because we do understand, we should go out and try to share the gospel with others. And so that's, let us be found as that wise servant, you know, who, who was given the talents that we've been given, the talent of knowing the Lord, and of knowing the gospel and knowing how to preach the gospel laws, and let's go out and let's multiply it. Now, let's not just be the, you know, Lord, you saved me, and here, and here I am. It's just me. You know, Lord, Lord, you saved me, and I've brought also other these others with me. Amen. You know, and then we can hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we should all want to hear. But that's going to require us being faithful and serving God in truth. Let's go ahead and pray.